Okay, now we're recording. Um, so hello again, this is Cassidy Ellis, Local Governments Program Manager for the City Efficiency Leadership Council here at SPEAR. Um, today, I'm very excited to uh, discuss the energy water nexus um, with our speaker, Jonathan Kleinman from Aqueous. Um, this is a topic that I think is often, um, is often brought up in sustainability conversations, and I think it's an important part of um, public sector energy management discussions, especially uh, moving forward as um, water increasingly becomes a limiting resource in Texas. Um, Jonathan actually shared uh, this presentation or something close to this presentation at our recent member workshop and it was very well received and um, I just thought it was a really great opportunity to bring this conversation to the broader audience of the City Efficiency Leadership Council. As usual, I'm going to get started with uh, just an overview of CELC. Again, it's a collaborative network of city of Texas cities and other public entities sharing information and resources around public sector energy management. These webinars are part of the programming, but we also develop uh, case studies. We have a city efficiency toolkit. We host regional roundtable luncheons, which we have some coming up, which I'll share. Um, if you're interested in getting involved, this is how you do it. You attend these webinars or you reach out to me directly and um, we can discuss the resources and opportunities uh, for how we can support your energy management goals. The announcements this time. So as I mentioned, we have some City Efficiency Leadership Council roundtables coming up in the near future. Um, the North Central Texas Roundtable is coming up in two weeks from today, I believe, um, or from yesterday. On October 30th, it will be at the um, Arlington Downtown Library, and JT Douglas from the City of Denton is going to share some of their um, both internal energy efforts as well as community outreach efforts um, in the North Texas region. Gulf Coast meeting will probably be um, in one of the weeks straddling Thanksgiving, um, working on getting a date and location nailed down. And then our Central Texas meeting um, is uh, due to be hosted at the Public Safety Training Center in Kyle um, on December 11th. And that will include a building tour of this facility where police officers and law enforcement train and um, hopefully we'll get to see uh, some of the cool facilities that they have um, at that building. It's also a green building, which is interesting. Um, our next webinar uh, is on November 21st. It will be at 10 a.m. rather than our usual 9 a.m. Central. And um, we will have Cascade Energy kind of continuing the conversation around water and wastewater um, and some strategic energy management strategies and um, best practices for water and wastewater systems. Um, I mentioned last month we have released a new white paper related to um, energy savings performance contracting, uh, which I will distribute a link after this webinar um, for anyone that's interested in learning more about that. And finally, I want to um, make another plug for the Texas Energy Summit. There are still scholarships available. This is a great opportunity to learn more about the Texas Energy uh, world. Um, there will be legislatures there, uh, experts in the energy world from throughout the state of Texas. Um, and there are um, still public sector scholarships available for anyone who is interested. Okay, so with that, I'm actually going to go, um, go ahead and turn it over to our speaker, Jonathan Kleinman, co-founder and CEO of Aqueous. Um, and let him introduce a little bit more about himself. Um, reminder, if you have questions, please um, post your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will pick those up um, at the end of the presentation. So with that, Jonathan, I will stop sharing my screen and you can take over. Thanks, Cassidy, and good morning, everyone. Um, let me get couple of things set up here so that I'm able to see any of the Q&A that shows up. Oh, I can't see that. Okay, oh, there's the Q&A box. All right, awesome. All right, good morning. 
So, uh, so I'm Jonathan Kleinman. Um, I am the uh, co-founder and CEO of Iquius. We are an Austin, Texas-based company, and we work for water and energy utilities primarily on a software as a service platform to help municipal utilities and other utilities offer customer programs. Uh, my background is in energy efficiency and water conservation. I've been working in demand management since 2001, um, and I've worked for organizations that implement and deliver these types of programs, uh, and also organizations that plan, design, and evaluate these programs. Uh, I'm a certified energy manager and have been since 2000 and, uh, 2003. So what I want to talk to you today about is the water and energy nexus. Um, it has, of course, turned cold and started raining a little bit, which means that it's not as interesting to people as it was, I don't know, last week since we were in the 90 degrees, and we will be again over the weekend. Um, but if there's anything that I want people to take away from after this conversation, it's that if you're going to look at carbon reduction or energy efficiency improvements and you want to focus on your water sector, then focusing water conservation where it takes the most energy to get water to that location, if you're a utility, makes a lot of sense. If you're an end use customer, uh, focusing water conservation where your rates are gonna be the highest, which means where you're paying both water and sewer, uh, or where you are using heat on that water is what's going to make the most sense. Um, when you're developing a more in energy intensive water and wastewater system, um, and that may be because due to water rely, you know, scarcity issues, you are trying to create a system that is less dependent upon precipitation, um, then that's when it's a really good idea to design and implement a water demand management strategy. In other words, right size your facility and minimize the amount of water that you have to produce. Um, that's what's gonna help you manage your energy consumption ultimately. And then finally, if you're looking at new water and wastewater facilities, energy efficiency and distributed energy resources need to be identified and discussed during planning uh, because the bulk of the savings occurs when you are even starting to think about your plant. It's not something that you can simply pull together once you are through permitting and then you start working on design. The most energy savings result from newer treatment technologies and those have to be approved prior to receiving your permit. And so if you wait until design to start talking about these things, you will have lost the majority of opportunities to help manage your energy requirements and your carbon requirements or your carbon impacts. So with that, I'll get into the rest of the presentation um, and try to provide some context around all those points that I just made. All right, so why are we talking about this? Um, there's interfaces between water scarcity and electricity supply and reliability. ERCOT, in fact, um, <clears throat> the Electric Reliability Council of Texas uh, has water scarcity uh, planning scenarios that they look at when they're trying to figure out uh, what is going to be the long-term reliability of our electricity supply. And as we're looking at things like desalination or direct portable reuse, all of those are going to be more energy intensive because the treatment requirements are much more stringent. Um, for those of you who are in uh, municipalities, you're realizing that a lot of your capital infrastructure on the water wastewater side uh, is coming due because we're nearing the end of the useful life of the facilities that were built when they were funded by the Clean Water Act back in the 60s and the 70s. Um, and uh, both water and energy utilities are starting to see declining revenues as uh, more water conserving devices in addition to more energy efficiency devices are starting to come on the market. So there's a lot of interconnections here, especially in Texas. And so these conversations are worth having as people start to think about their long-term water and energy future. So we're gonna talk about water in Texas and I've included uh, Oklahoma just because for folks who are close to the border, it's relevant. We'll talk about uh, water needs for thermoelectric power in Texas. 
Um, we'll go over the water and energy sector and energy end uses, talk through some case studies, and then discuss strategies and opportunities. Um, as Cassidy noted, people should feel free to go ahead and uh, you know, ask a question as we go through this in order to uh, be able to facilitate some kind of conversation and dialogue. All right. So if we look at the U.S. drought monitor, um, you can see that this summer was relatively dry. Uh, when I gave this first uh, presentation to the SPEAR member workshop back in September, uh, there was an increasing uh, area of Texas that was starting to get into severe and even in some areas in extreme drought. Uh, we hadn't seen a map like this since 2011 or so. And um, this zone here in Oklahoma and that zone there uh, in Texas uh, represented an area that got hardest hit by the drought back in 2011. What's interesting is that um, the areas of extreme drought uh, have increased in Texas, um, but that zone in Oklahoma uh, and also here in Texas has gotten some rain. And that's just within the past month. So one of the things that is unique about uh, trying to work in an area like water conservation and thinking about water scarcity reliability is that the situation changes frequently. Um, unlike, uh, you know, it, with uh, energy reliability uh, or energy efficiency where, yes, use is somewhat climate dependent but not dependent upon rain. Um, for those who have not looked at the Texas State Water Plan and especially the interactive map, I encourage you to do so. Um, it's a fascinating website and allows you to play with tons of data from the 50-year plan that the state of Texas provides. Um, and what you can see is that municipal use in Texas is projected to grow fairly significantly over the 50-year time horizon that they were planning for, and that's driven primarily by population growth. Um, you can see that um, our existing supplies in blue decline somewhat as there's an expectation that some things are going to come offline. Um, but you can see that the need, which is the uh, area in red, is growing pretty significantly over time. There are strategy supplies. Those strategy supplies include water conservation. Uh, they also include the construction of some additional uh, resources. But in Texas overall, water conservation is going to play an increasingly important part of managing <clears throat> our ability to meet future water needs uh, for the population. And even if that isn't so much of an issue now, uh, it's going to be and will increasingly become part of it, at least within the next 20 years. Um, when I was looking at information for uh, Oklahoma, and I'll skip past this quickly, um, the, let's see, the, kind of the official resource for water use is provided by the U.S. Uh, Geological Survey. Uh, they have uh, a paper called The Estimated Use of Water in the United States. It's provided every five years. The most recent one is uh, 2015. There's a lot of information uh, state by state that may be of interest to people, and I provide the link to that paper for those who are interested. Um, now, if we take a look at water for electricity generation, you can see that uh, there's a difference between withdrawals and consumption. Um, the primary water used for electricity generation is for cooling, and mostly plants are taking water out and then returning it at a slightly higher temperature uh, in order to make sure that the thermoelectric cycle is continuing to run. Consumption comes from leaks and uh, evaporation, so water that actually disappears. Um, and what you can see is that, you know, here you've got one through cooling systems as opposed to recirculating systems. Uh, recirculating systems are higher on uh, consumption because you've got more evaporation. Uh, they are lower on total withdrawals. Um, but these once through systems require water availability where they're pulling the water from. And you can see that, you know, thermoelectric sources like nuclear coal, uh, biopower, uh, combined cycle natural gas, you start seeing these requirements go down a bit. If you've got a cooling pond, uh, you know, total withdrawals go down. Uh, but if you're looking at dry cooled systems or renewable systems, obviously the water requirement goes down. Um, most important thing to keep in mind is that a lot of our base load 
has water requirements and the Texas state plan that takes a look at that, you can see that the total demands for water for thermoelectric power are increasing as well. Uh, and that again comes from population growth with projected increases. Uh, the strategy supplies in Texas, um, you know, the needs there increase as well. Uh, I don't know the extent to which things like renewable resources or other forms of, um, you know, power plants factor into the uh, demands here for thermoelectric. And that's just an interesting area where ERCOT and the Water Development Board might be able to talk to one another a little bit better. So if we think about what's happening in the water sector and how this is going to impact the water energy nexus, um, just a few quick slides. There's an expectation nationally that up to a trillion dollars is going to be spent over the next 10 to 20 years to change out our total water sector. Again, the expected lifetime for plants is 40 to 50 years. Most of the federal funding, uh, federally funded construction occurred in the 60s and 70s, so the plants are uh, in need of not just repair, but full-scale retrofit and the um, uh, the, the public water supply, water quality standards, and also the wastewater water quality standards are starting to become more stringent, <clears throat> and we're starting to deal with newer issues. You've got pharmaceuticals that are showing up in wastewater affluent. You've got caffeine showing up in wastewater affluent. Um, and people are starting to be concerned about the levels at which those things are accumulating in the water supplies. And so we are going to need to start to figure out how to deal with those things uh, in the future, that's going to require more treatment and more energy going into that treatment. Um, for water systems in general, operations and maintenance costs are increasing, and growing energy consumption is one of the reasons why O&M costs are going up. So if we think about where energy requirements for water and wastewater treatment come from, um, you can see that in the, on a water supply basis, most of the energy goes into the distribution. So these days, if you're taking relatively high quality water from a river or a surface water body or even shallow groundwater, you know, the sourcing of that water is relatively uh, inintensive. You know, treatment isn't that hard, but then you gotta push it out to the rest of your distribution system. And we'll show a graph of Austin and. Uh, kind of highlight how that number changes depending upon how far uphill you've got to go. Um, for wastewater treatment, you can see that um, where you're taking a relatively uh, clean water supply, like a groundwater source, for example, and you're just going to push it through, or sorry, uh, if you're just using trickling filter system for wastewater, I apologize, it, it doesn't take that much energy to uh, treat it. But when you're starting to get to advanced treatment with nitrification, you can see that the, you know, the outer bound of uh, consumption has gotten to about 3,000 um, kilowatt hours per million gallons. Uh, just taking a quick check to see if we have any questions right now, and it does not appear that we do. All right. So if we look at you know, how much of a range there is, um, for water supply, the energy requirement per million gallons is a strong function of um, where the water has to go once you treat it. And based upon a compilation of a number of different studies, we can see that um, it can be anywhere from, you know, the 25th percentile, only about uh, 1250 kilowatt hours per million gallons. You know, on the 75th percentile from this study, you know, we've got about 3,000. Um, but we, you know, we did see studies where even it was as high as 11,000 kilowatt hours per million gallons. Um, in that case, it was a groundwater supply that required a pretty good amount of uh, pumping to get it up and then treatment, and then it had to keep going further uphill uh, for distribution. So one of the important things to recognize here is that the amount of energy that goes into water supply is a strong function of your system. Um, and where you're getting your water from. And so it's very difficult to come up with generalizations and kind of one-size-fits-all recommendations or multipliers for the energy intensity of water. Um, and even within an existing system, you can have a lot of distribution. All right, we do have a question. One moment. 
what is the basis for the energy intensity numbers? So these numbers come from um, studies that are performed locally. So people have to pull the uh, annual energy consumption information from the, not just the treatment plant, but also the list stations, and then compare that against the, um, uh, the sorry, the, the total amount of uh, water that is, the volume of water that is, you know, treated and distributed. And then those, all of those things have to be aligned. Um, so you need the right amount of metering, and then you need good and the right amount of data. <clears throat> so organizations like the Regional Water Authority in Sacramento you know, did a study uh, of all of its, just, you know, member utilities to figure out what the difference is. Um, that same work was done here by Austin Energy. Uh, and what you can see is that close to the river, um, your energy intensity is only about 3,500 kilowatt hours per million gallons. But as you start to move a little bit further up in the hill country and closer towards, uh, you know, getting the water back to what its source was, you know, you're starting to look at 5,500 or more uh, kilowatt hours per million gallons. Uh, are there any other questions on this topic? Okay, so um, to put things in context, let's take a look at uh, my house. So uh, here's my home, uh, it's about 2,000 square feet, and uh, there are five of us who live there. Uh, my daughter, who's now six, is a more active participant in our water consumption than she used to be. So um, over the years, I've done a number of things to improve the energy efficiency of the home. So we've had compact fluorescent lights. Now we've got LEDs that those are you know, failing now that we're 10 years into the house. Uh, we made significant building envelope improvements in the ceiling and also the windows, and we've got ENERGY STAR appliances throughout. On a water efficiency basis, our uh, consumption is 31 gallons per capita per day. Uh, that's about one half of the national average, and that comes from having low flow fixtures, uh, Energy Star appliances, and also just being more attentive to water consumption in the house. So if you look at my annual electric consumption, and this is data from the Austin Energy portal that I took a look at today, you know, my total consumption is uh, just over 9,000 kilowatt hours uh, over the course of the year. You know, and you can see a strong seasonality of that consumption uh, and even get a handle on, you know, what my air conditioning load is. Um, if you look at the annual electric equivalent of my water supply, that's only 240 kilowatt hours. And that comes from assuming somewhere between 4,000 and 4,500 kilowatt hours per million gallons. So what, it, what this does is it shows that from a carbon basis, if you were to compare, you know, trying to help me further improve my energy efficiency versus trying to get me to implement more water conservation, um, you're going to get more energy savings by focusing on the electric. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to give you a basis of comparison. A lot of people think about the water energy nexus as like the silver bullet for additional electric savings or additional carbon savings. Um, it helps, but it's not, you know, Getting me to change on my toilets is not going to be the thing that really drives overall energy savings for the grid. In this particular case, Austin Energy would still be better uh, informed to focus on my electricity consumption rather than my water consumption. Any questions there? All right. So, but one of the things that's going to change that calculus are some evolving strategies for water supply. So Wichita Falls, for example, um, uh, implemented a direct potable reuse system. And so there you've got uh, treated wastewater effluent that was connected directly to the water supply intake. Um, going that direction to be able to um, provide a more reliable water supply is going to require obviously much more aggressive treatment, and that treatment is going to be a lot more energy intensive. Uh, Abilene, Texas, and the Hamby Reclamation Facility um, uses what's called indirect potable reuse. Uh, in that particular case, the wastewater effluent is discharged into the water supply, where it resides within that system for a while, and then is uh, taken out for water treatment that's still more energy intensive than simply treating it, discharging it, and having that go downstream. 
Uh, and then finally, you've got uh, desal. Um, you know, and looking at that, for example, for Corpus Christi, desalination requires um, either the use of some kind of osmotic system to be able to take the salt and other impurities out of the water before distributing that into the, into the uh, drinking water supply. That's very energy intensive as well. So um, as we start moving in this direction, the, the you know energy equivalent for water supply starts to go up, and that's when um, it makes more sense if you're thinking about how much do I want my energy bill to be, to consider not just how am I designing this facility, but how much water do I want to have to produce. And that's when water conservation could become a very effective energy efficiency strategy for these types of facilities. Let me just see if there are any questions there. Okay. All right, so if we think about what's going on inside a water and wastewater facility, um, for water treatment, this is similar to the conversations we've had. Finished water pumping represents the bulk of overall energy consumption. Um, down in wastewater treatment, if you're using um, uh, you know, digestion uh, as, a, as a method, um, a good chunk of your energy consumption is required for the aeration of uh, the water to be able to give the bugs um, what they need to do their magic. So, um, you know, if you're thinking about what do I do about uh, energy efficiency and reducing total energy requirements, here is how do I make my uh, pumping more efficient, and down here is how do I make my treatment system more efficient. So, uh, for those folks on the phone who are um, end use consumers of water rather than suppliers of water, um, you know, what we're seeing is that the projected future costs for water are going to uh, rise significantly faster than they are for, say, natural gas or for electricity. And so, those O&M costs mean that the end use consumer, um, you know, at, especially in the commercial and industrial sector, need to be thinking about water conservation just to manage their own bills. Um, and you can see that very significant energy savings can be accomplished, sorry, very significant water savings can be accomplished um, by, uh, you know, improving the air conditioning system, getting total reductions in water use, uh, and that can have a significant impact on the long-term bill. All right, we did get a question. So given aging infrastructure and increasing cost of new water sourcing, do you anticipate any major shift in the cost impacting your own home? Okay, if so, to what degree? Um, so, you know, uh, in, in Austin in particular, um, I think that uh, sewer costs are going up faster than water costs. I mean, that's a, a national trend. And so, um, reducing the total amount of uh, sewerage that I pro produce is important. Um, one of the things that water systems do need to continue to think about, however, is that um, sewer systems were designed with the assumption that a certain amount of flow is necessary to continue to move all of the uh, stuff, right? from the home down to the sewer treatment facility. And certain jurisdictions that have really aggressively promoted water conservation, like Scottsdale, are actually having to flush those lines in order to clean them out, which kind of defeats the purpose of water conservation. Um, is this a rate structure issue? Uh, it is somewhat, but the volume of water and the volume of wastewater is going down. And um, so starting to move things to more of a fixed cost rather than a variable cost is uh, one of the rate design issues that can be brought, but that decreases the uh, incentive for water conservation. And so that's where you're bumping into um, similar types of problems that you've got um, that you have in the electricity side. So I can come back to this discussion, <clears throat> but these are, these are good questions uh, to be asking. It, um, so if you're thinking about if you're an end use customer, you know where are your water uses to focus? It's a function of what type of facility you operate. Uh, this is information from the WaterSense program uh, that's run by US EPA, and you can see that if you're in you know, a restaurant or healthcare versus a school or college, 
you know, whether you've got a domestic restroom, cooling, heating, landscaping, or commercial kitchen, um, you know, your, your, your water use profile determines where you should be focusing your time. All right. So what are some of the opportunities for the water energy nexus? If you're looking at a water treatment facility, <clears throat> then, you know, the percent of savings at the measure level are um, <clears throat> a function of, you know, where you're, you're looking. So, um, you know, on pump and motor, um, using VFCs and also um, optimizing the, um, the pump system operation can produce, you know, up to 40% savings uh, just on the pump and the motor end use. And so for water use distribution, that is a really great way to uh, focus. You can see that, um, <clears throat> you know, your um, under treatment processes, going to new treatment systems like advanced reverse osmosis or capacitive, sorry, deionization can reduce treatment by about 50%. But remember, that was the lowest component of overall uh, energy use for current water systems. Uh, and then finally, if you start putting uh, wind and solar onto your system, you can achieve 10 to 25 percent reduction of total system energy. Um, here we've got some information about dollars per yearly KWA save. You can see that your renewables are, are significantly higher. Um, on, uh, and so using VFDs and better controls is your most cost-effective strategy for your water supply. If you look at wastewater treatment, there's a number of different options, <clears throat> but your biggest savings are gonna come from new treatment processes. And you can see that you've got, um, you know, 60% reduction, you know, 60% reduction, 70% <clears throat> reduction on the treatment processes. That's where uh, your uh, area, that's where you should focus um, we try to provide some cost per yearly KWA saved information here, again, to highlight, you know, where you can be focusing. Uh, but what's interesting is that, um, you know, depending upon the measure that you are implementing, and whether it's water or wastewater, you can see that uh, measures that are going to uh, provide the bulk of energy savings need to be addressed at the pre-planning and planning stage. Because once you get uh, your permit, and you've already made your treatment technology selections, um, then you start looking at things that are kind of after the fact options. And that while they do provide savings, um, these savings are not nearly as high. So for those who are currently talking about what are we gonna do about our existing systems, it's a great time to be working with your environmental engineering firms and hopefully their mechanical subcontractors and energy specialists to think about what is your long-term energy supply, uh, and <clears throat> what are the long-term energy requirements going to be for your supply or your treatment options. So um, finally, there are emerging uh, technologies that are going to provide deeper savings, and you can see that all of these need to be talked about during pre-planning and planning not only is it an issue of design, but it's also getting the regulators on board. Uh, let's see, the cost savings to KWH are challenging compared to the cost of electricity. Okay, um, if I go back to these numbers, this is per yearly. And so remember, this is a one-time cost compared to a lifetime of savings. So these are not levelized cost information. Um, so if each one of these is gonna you know, last for 20 or 30 years, Take these numbers, divide them by 20, and that's going to be your comparison. Um, so, you know, if I'm looking at a uh, 44 cent per kWh per year number for automated uh, an automated control system, if I divide that by 20, that's actually 2.2 cents per kWh. So, um, for that reason, this could actually mean that, like on a 30-year uh, bond you are better off adding the cost of this measure than otherwise. Um, and if, if there's a need for or a benefit to looking at what's the cost of saved energy versus the cost of purchased energy, that's something that uh, we could tackle at a later time. Um, bottom line is take these numbers. This is to provide a, a, a relative point of comparison, but I would divide all of these by 20 and then compare these to the cost of what you're paying for electricity.
All right. Um, so wastewater treatment, again, uh, a number of emerging technologies or advanced technologies, uh, and you can see that some of these can be uh, implemented uh, after uh, operation has occurred. Um, uh, sorry. So these were, uh, this is a study that was done for the Energy Trust of Oregon, and I didn't uh, take some of that information off before. Uh, but you can see the feasibility of introducing a measure at the construction and operation phase. Uh, it depends upon uh, the uh, decisions that are made uh, across the entire plant. Because just doing one of these things isn't isolated to overall plant operation. Uh, I don't have as nicely formatted of a list for uh, end users, uh, but what we do have here are different measures that can be uh, evaluated depending upon the applicable technology, whether it's a dishwasher, ice machine, et cetera. Uh, and then you can see the relative uh, low, medium, high energy savings potential um, as you compare them. Uh, across the board. All right. I have a number of case studies in only 20 minutes, so I'm going to go very quickly through these and I can come back. Uh, here, we did some work to look at a specific water treatment plant, comparing the treatment volume versus electric demand. That was the way that we were able to look at um, kind of the KWH per million gallons. Um, what we did was we took the information and uh, organized it around where uh, energy use was going. In this particular case, raw water pumping was relatively high, as was internal plant pumping. And so one of the things that we noticed was that in order to get the um, uh, our model pump energy use to align with the actual bills, <clears throat> we ended up needing to show or, or reducing the efficiency of those pumps and motor systems to anywhere from 60 to only 80% to get everything to align. Um, that showed us that being able to increase the pump efficiency um, provides a significant opportunity for savings, and that doesn't necessarily require replacing the pump. It just means that you need the pump to operate at its most efficient point. There's actually a company based in Georgetown, Texas, that specializes in a control system that gets every pump to operate at the best point of the pump curve, and they are able to achieve anywhere from 25 to 35% in pump energy use without changing anything except for the control. We did an audit at the University of uh, Central Missouri. Um, we found a lot of interesting things going on. You know, we, we took their uh, water consumption, energy consumption, and broke it out by buildings. Um, we found a number of uh, water-cooled ice machines where, um, I don't know if you can see it down here, but that was a steady stream of water going directly into the drain. So it was basically a once-through water-cooled ice machine, which in theory is more efficient than an air-cooled one, uh, but not if you take into account the water and sewer consumption uh, from a cost perspective. So um, one of the things that we noticed for end users is that, um, you know, using Energy Star equipment and starting to think through, should I be using a water or air-cooled version of this equipment? Um, old decisions that used to focus on water-cooled equipment because it was more efficient on an energy basis need to be revisited as uh, water and sewer costs in particular start to increase. Um, and from a facilities operation perspective, uh, just observing whether, you know, uh, school was out of season, ice was not needed, this thing was not shut off. Um, there's a lot of things that can be accomplished through just operations and maintenance savings. Um, I encourage everybody to tune in to that uh, webinar on the 21st. Uh, strategic energy management can achieve, you know, 9 to 10% reduction in uh, energy consumption at a water and wastewater facility and significantly more dollar savings uh, for end, use, uh, end users in particular. Um, so we looked at things like uh, solar PV um, at a, uh, you know, a water supply utility. Uh, we looked at uh, the possibility of putting in hydro turbines into existing water distribution lines. That's particularly useful where you've got significant elevation change and an opportunity to capture some of the energy that you are putting into that system. 
Um, Essex Junction, Vermont did a cogeneration facility. So where you've got anaerobic digestion, you have biogas as an output, and um, you can capture that and use it uh, to uh, burn and then create electricity as well as the heat necessary for your, uh, your system. And uh, that can be done uh, these days more cost effectively than before. So here's the company, Specific Energy in Georgetown. Uh, for anybody who's got a water system, I encourage you to get in touch with them. Um, Aqua Water Supply Corporation in Bastrop found that, you know, saw a 25% uh, reduction in one of its well pumps, uh, also achieved a 16% energy reduction at one of its pump stations. This can be done on a retrofit basis, very cost effectively. Um, uh, and uh, there's somebody that I would encourage that everybody uh, go out and talk to. So what are your strategies? You know, so if you're a water utility, even if you're a water, wastewater utility, look at your capital improvements plan, try to get a, a, a benchmarking, a facility audit done, <clears throat> prioritize advanced energy projects and estimate your savings, uh, engage with energy utilities. Uh, there are energy efficiency programs throughout the state and it requires a little bit more measurement and verification, but you can get rebates to help you pay for this. Finally, you need to engage upstream. You need to be talking to regulators, um, especially if you're looking at new treatment technologies to get them to uh, buy into the fact that you're doing something different. Um, the state's water bank, the Texas Water Development Board, is interested in reducing the long-term uh, cost of plant operation, and they can be an important ally in these conversations. And if you're an end user, this is exactly the same thing. Identify and evaluate, engage with energy utilities for um, <clears throat> energy savings projects and also hot water savings projects, and then you need to work upstream, attend conferences, get some ideas. All right, we are available to help. Um, we do audits, you know, we help identify what the efficiency potential is for water and energy. We help people find projects and you know, we provide measurement and verification templates to make this easy. And that concludes the presentation. So uh, I'm happy to get into a Q&A um, and figure out how we can uh, get you more information. These slides will be made available to people uh, who attended the presentation. So uh, Cassidy, I guess I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. That was fantastic. And very, very detailed. Um, really appreciate all of that information. So yeah, um, folks, uh, please contribute your questions to the Q&A. It looks like one just popped up. Um, do you have any advice for cities and users in engaging their utility to adopt EE technologies? Uh, and for clarification, is that uh, engaging the city's uh, water utility? Or are you looking at engaging your water or energy utility to get help to adopt technologies at your facility. Sorry, just trying to get clarification. Uh, okay, we'll let them respond. Or I could just speak to it in, in either sense. Maybe you can um, speak to both, yeah. <laughs> sure, okay. So wait, there we go. Pushing the water utility. Um, <clears throat> oh, that you see savings from. Okay, so in other words, if you're an end user and you're paying the bills for uh, a water utility inefficiency, how do we get the water or wastewater utility to um, do a better job? That's a great question. Okay. Um, so I think that there's a couple of different ways to go about that. Um, the uh, so the Texas chapter of <coughs> both the American Water Works Association and Water Environment Federation, they have resources on energy efficiency. Um, so I think directing your uh, water utility or your wastewater utility to uh, consider resources that exist in their own, that are provided by their own industry is useful. Um, it's especially important to see whether or not there is an energy manager <clears throat> at those facilities. Oftentimes, if it's a smaller entity, there isn't a dedicated energy manager. Um, and so one of the challenges is in having them uh, have their resource. 
the first thing that you might want to do is to um, ask the water utility uh, or the city for information on let's just figure out what's going on you know what are the what are what is the total energy bill for the facility relative to the amount of water that's provided <clears throat> or you know what is, what's the kwh per million gallons for water and wastewater and then compare it to some of the numbers here um, if it's high then um, i think there's an opportunity to have a conversation if it's relatively low then that's good information also to have. It doesn't mean that you couldn't pursue something like a, a strategic energy management approach. Um, so if you're an end user, I think that the way to start would be information gathering and benchmarking and then comparison with you know, what you're seeing or, or what we could provide in terms of other pieces of information. That's the first step, <clears throat> hopefully to create some conversations. Um, if you can't even get that step to happen, then you have to go talk to somebody at council or on the board and get them interested in trying to gather this information. So um, it's political, but I would start with information. Okay. And um, if you're trying to get your utility for help, there's a, there's a lot of different things that are going on. If you have uh, cooling towers, getting your utility to work with you on how to reduce the water requirements for cooling towers um, provides benefits to both entities. Um, Water utilities can be hard pressed to provide good recommendations on water conservation, but there are some cities in Texas, like Dallas, like San Antonio, um, that provide very, very good uh, water conservation programs for institutional, commercial, and industrial customers. Um, if you're interested in energy efficiency, then if you're a municipal utility customer, I think reaching out to their energy efficiency program, if they have it, you should be able to get some support. If you're in the ERCOT territory and you're in the competitive market, then you would need to speak with your transmission and distribution utilities. So the, the Encores, the American Electric Powers, the Entergies, the center points of the state, um, they should be able to direct you to resources to help look at energy efficiency. Great. Um, so we have, some representatives from a few pretty major communities throughout the state. And um, I know sometimes getting audio to work on this can be a little bit of a challenge, but I'm curious if any of the city or public sector folks would have any interest in sharing kind of how your cities are thinking about water and um, incorporating water efforts into your um, energy and sustainability work. So if you are interested in sharing, um, there's you can raise your hand and I can allow you to talk um, or you can type your thoughts into the Q&A box. Um, but I'm definitely interested to hear how the water conversation is um, being incorporated into your, your climate and sustainability work. Um, yeah, Jonathan, I, uh, I, I think what was really um, interesting to me is I, so I have spent a fair amount of time recently in my work with um, the ESCO community and with um, energy savings performance contracting approach to facility improvements. And I keep hearing that um, water conservation measures have some of the most immediate payback. So switching out toilets, um, toilets and domestic water um, fixtures have a really immediate payback, but it seems like kind of what I'm hearing is that it, it may have a quick payback, but maybe not a large magnitude of payback on the individual facility side. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I wish we had talked about this earlier. Um, there's a, uh, uh, I can find a presentation that was given by, um, uh, her name escapes me, but she uh, she presented it at WaterSmart um, WaterSmart Innovations Conference, and she uh, helps to run or oversee the federal energy management program. Um, and they did a review of all of the uh, ESCO projects that were completed, <clears throat> and they found that um, to your point, most ESCO projects focus on 
the um, fixture replacements, toilets, aerators, shower heads, et cetera, um, because those are easily identifiable and a lot of the ESCOs um, only have energy expertise uh, kind of under the hood. But the majority of water savings comes from things, um, if we go back to, hold on a second, let me go back to this slide here. Uh, where were the, one moment, do, 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 here we go, okay. So, um, so if you're doing an ESCO project at a, uh, a healthcare facility, then yes, you can save significant water um, in domestic and restroom, but um, toilets, for example, and I, I had to learn about this, um, because of what you may be flushing down the toilet at a hospital, um, you know, you can't necessarily just put a low flow toilet uh, into a, a hospital um, a hospital room. You've got to think about you know, what's actually in those rooms. But cooling and heating is a very significant uh, portion of water consumption. And cooling towers in particular, um, there are a number of strategies to reduce the water consumption associated with that. Um, so a lot of the water savings possibilities are custom or at least just fall outside of the expertise of the ESCO. And so I think that the ESCOs need to build more in-house capacity and capability to handle these um, commercial these uh, commercial opportunities <clears throat> and a lot of the expertise resides in uh, kind of unique providers uh, Eddie Wilcut for example at Allen Plumber Associates they're headquartered out of the Dallas Fort Worth area but he is in Austin um, you know he is one of the uh, institutional commercial and industrial experts um, in the country for water conservation. And I think it's important that the ESCOs figure out and get the expertise to be able to tackle those kinds of opportunities which exist in other types of consulting companies. Does that help answer your question, Kathy? Yeah, it does. And I think it's interesting to um, kind of that that's a new uh, area of expansion for ESCOs that I've heard. I mean, I think there is a lot of conversation happening in that world about kind of the evolving scope of their work with with pub the public sector. And I think water and and clean tech are really um, clean energy are really emerging. And I'm curious about this graph. I, this piqued my interest at our member workshop as well. This miscellaneous category seemed very sweeping and at, and an yeah. outlier. <laughs> yeah. What is that? So I, I, I would want to go back to Jonah Schein uh, at um, uh, WaterSense and to get more information about that. Uh, I agree. I don't know what mis miscellaneous is, uh, so I would need maybe to, it's uh, light light industrial. I don't. Well, this appears to be uh, the total, right? Not just percent, but it's total. So if you take every other building type and throw it in here then it ends up being the you know the most million gallons per year um so this is not a percent distribution so i think the reason it's so big is because it represents so many other building types um <clears throat> but what's interesting is that if you look at everybody else combined you know you just have to look at the relative shape of this graph and compare it to or the relative sizes of these bars and find something that's kind of similar. Like to me, it look, that one looks a lot like uh, maybe uh, office buildings or even schools. Again, it's just how big is the blue? I could go ahead and change this up to make it percents rather than um, total volume just to uh, make that more informative. Interesting. Great, well, I think um, unless there are any other questions from the audience, Okay, um, then uh, I think we'll, we'll call it there unless you had any um, final thoughts, Jonathan, um, or any, uh, anything to share just, with the audience. Yeah, I just I want to go back to the beginning um, and kind of what I said at the outset. So, um, you know, the, the, uh, the water energy nexus in terms of providing, uh, you know, significant carbon benefits, if, if you're a community for your sustainability initiative, um, at the current moment, it's still pretty amazing 
to be honest, that we can get water at our houses, at our office buildings, that doesn't make us sick <clears throat> for so little energy. It really is phenomenal that that happens day in, day out. Um, and what that means is that the energy benefits associated with reducing water demand, uh, unless you're in a particularly energy intensive area, it's just not that high. Uh, but stay, I think the issue is stay tuned. Uh, that is changing. Um, and we have to do more to keep our water supply reliable and also to make sure that we keep that water supply healthy, both from an environmental perspective and from a public health perspective. And finally, um, yes, I think that there are opportunities to approach your city council, your municipalities, to improve the energy performance of the water and wastewater supply. Um, the easiest way to start that conversation is through benchmarking. A lot of them are thinking about um, upgrading their systems anyway, and much of that shows up in the state water plan. And so the data is out there to be able to help figure out where to start that conversation. Uh, at the state level, the Texas Water Development Board could be more aggressively pursuing energy efficiency uh, in the state water planning activities. Um, you know, and there's something called the Water Conservation Advisory Council that can make that happen. So um, I'm available uh, if people just want to reach out and ask questions and get more specific advice for your specific circumstances. Uh, but to everybody who showed up today, uh, thank you for being here and thank you to Spear for uh, promoting this topic uh, within the state of Texas. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Have a good rest of your day. Bye.